So this just shows some crop seeds and some weed seeds, and the, the point is they're, they're real different inside. So red root, ragweed, giant foxtail, most vegetable farms don't have problems with those. Um, and then some crop seeds, these are uh, field crops, but you know, you can put snap beans here and peas here and squash and beans in there. So, so um, a lot of our crops are large seeded, um, and a lot of the small seeded crops, uh, you know, fresh market growers and, and organic growers transplant a lot of those crops. So they essentially take something that's a small seed and make it big in terms of making it competitive with the crop. And uh, the advantage to that is that then the crop has a head start over the weeds. And you want to maintain that, uh, that head start. Perhaps you'll get to it a little bit later. You talked about keeping the soil surface dry so that you don't have the germination of weed seeds. Uh -huh. But then you get periods of rain where you know, everything's just wet. Will you be talking about that? Well, what you do, and specifically going to address it. You I mean if you get yeah, okay. two weeks of rain when you yeah. should be out cultivating, and you can't. Exactly. Well, then you're kind of in a catch-up situation. You've got to rethink your your weed management program for that crop. All right. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to emphasize here is having a, a, a variety of different tooling that you can put on your cultivator or different cultivator, different kind of different equipment that you can use in different situations. Um, and, you know, not, not every tool is useful in every situation. And uh, sometimes in that case, you need, to, you need to do something pretty different. I once had a soybean crop. It, uh, after we planted it, it started raining and it rained for three of those. It was about 20, 25 days. Uh, just continuous rain or drizzle or, or you know dark cloudy weather, the soil did not dry out. The crop got to the second trifoliate and I called up a, a friend of mine who's very experienced organic um, field crop grower and I said, you know, should I try to pine weed this or should we just go right to the row crop cultivator? He said, my neighbor has second trifoliate uh, soybeans that he's time weeding for the first time today. He's, he's in Penn Yam, uh, where they've got a lot of real concentration of organic field crop work. And um, we set up the time weeder in such a way that we could we could weed it and we got most of them. It was not the cleanest crop I've ever had, but it wasn't terrible. You know, so the point is you can you can reconfigure things in ways that you probably haven't in the past and try to do it. Chuck, um, speaking of soybeans, um, for my soybeans this year, it seems like I don't have a time here at this point in time, so I need to shoot a row cultivator, but I went in and it was getting, it was probably later than I normally would first time around just because of the dry weather we had. And I mean, I figured it was time to get the weeds out of control over there, which I thought I did, but then we got like a, a rain within a week after that. And I probably should turn right around and went right back at it again because the, the second flush it just they went crazy. Yeah. Um, and you know one sometimes, you know, in a certain year one cultivation's enough, but like this year it should have been like two to a week apart. Yeah. I've had the same situation where, you know, we usually do try to do one pre emergence, one post emergence, but sometimes, you know, a third pass in five year really makes a big difference. Um, I think it's a good idea to chop crop residue. Um, if, if you have coarse crop residue, you know, corn stalks or, or uh, you know, broccoli stems or something, um, you don't want to be throwing those into the crop. You don't want to be dragging over some tender young crop with a, with a cultivator chain. If you have any kind of drainage problems, you want to get those corrected. Um, whether it's you know, it need to be because your soil naturally has some drainage restrictions. Um, it may be only moderately well drained. Most people don't try to grow vegetables on anything worse than that. Um, I've seen situations where where a field 
that is moderately well drained and has good tile drainage, we could get in and cultivate. Um, and part of the field or the field next to it where we didn't have sufficient tile drainage, we couldn't get in and cultivate, and then it rains again, and you're into the situation you mentioned where you get a lot of, a lot of wet soil conditions and you can't do it. So, um, you know, you may miss your window if you don't have that good, good drainage. And, you know, even if you are on a well-drained soil, you can get compaction, you can get a plow pan, and, and a lot of vegetable producers have compaction problems in your soil. And, um, you know, a lot of extension folks, I know, uh, I know Robert, you've got a petrometer, right? Yeah, so um, you can talk to Robert and, and look and see if you've got a pan layer in your soil. If you do, you probably want to relieve that. Um, you can either relieve it by ripping or you can relieve it with deep-rooted uh, deep sod crops like alfalfa or clover. Um, and uh, take care of that because if the water's perched up there on the top, it could keep you out of the field and you need to be in there cultivating. Um, health really matters. Um, most of your, how many of you are organic, certified or not? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, if the soil is really cloddy and massive, it can really cause all kinds of problems for your cultivator. For, for when you're cultivating, you know, if you're throwing big clods into a small crop, that can damage the crop, and um, and that means you got to go slower. You got to be more careful. You have to set the machinery so that it's not as close to the crop as you could be otherwise. So you know, you don't want those clods there. Um, a good way of killing weeds is to move a little bit of soil into the into the crop row. You know, some crops can't take that, but a lot of them can. I mean, when we do our hoeing in the cabbage, cabbage is part of the crop rotation in the, um, in the organic cropping system, we, uh, we hoe towards the plant so that we move soil in around the base of it, and you can move about an inch in around the base of a cabbage, of a cabbage transplant and bury little tiny seedlings because, you know, when a land squatter or a pigweed or, or a gallon sow is first coming out of the ground, it's, you know, a quarter inch, half inch tall, and an inch of soil buries it, and then it's it. So um, you can throw a little bit of soil in, but if you've got chunks of soil that are two inches in diameter, you can't move those in there and cover that up. You want that nice, loose, uh, loose good tilt soil. Um, oh, yeah, and if you uh, shake, you know, your cultivator will shake the soil free from the roots better, too, if it's not not a massive condition. Um, Okay, so we're going to start talking about machinery a little more directly at this point. And uh, I think if you don't have a belly mounted cultivator, cultivating tractor, you need to get one. The reason is that if you're pulling the machine behind the tractor, you can't get the tooling as close to the road because you can't see where the tooling is. With a belly mounted cultivator, the, the tools are right below your feet. And so any little change in the tractor, you get immediate response for the tools. If they're way back behind you someplace and you change the tractor, so you, you pull away from the road that you're getting too close to with the front wheels of the tractor, what does that do to the cultivator? It swings it into that very row you're trying to avoid. And with a belly-mounted cultivator, that doesn't happen. And so uh, that first slide of the, of the talk was of a guy doing big acreage with a belly-mounted cultivator that he built a mound and did track. Um, but most of, you, most of you folks are not doing huge acreage in a two-row spine. And, um, and they make machines for that. So um, there's good reason to use them. And this, this is what I was saying. This just shows how close you can get. This is vegetable knives here coming out on either side. Of course, you can't see the knife or you can see the top of it. Um, but, uh, you know, here's, here's the crock row right here. You see, you're getting an inch or two, an inch and a half probably of the, the crock. Is it like a beet knife? Yeah, beet knife, vegetable knife, um, side knife, all, all the same tool, all the same thing. You know, just 
five different names. Now, is that a straight shank when you talk about knife? I've never seen a knife mounted on anything but a straight shank. Okay. Um, this is something people don't usually think about, but there, when you kill weeds with a cultivator, you're doing one of three things, or maybe two of three things. You're probably not doing all three. Um, you're either trying to bury the weed, or you're trying to dismember the weed, or you're trying to dig it out of the ground in such a way that it, um, the roots dry up and the plant dries out and dies. That way. Um, and if you think about it, there are going to be some situations in which you want to do one thing, and other situations in which you want to do a different thing. One of those three or two of them together. And, um, and they're not necessarily all happening equally well with a particular tool. This is a generalized broadleaf plant. You've got the root down here, you've got the cotyledons, and then some true leaves. If the, if the plant is cut between the root and the cotyledons on a broadleaf plant, that plant always dies. Okay? Um, so if you are trying to dismember this plant, what you want is a very flat tool going very near the soil surface. Okay? And you want it to be sharp. How many of you sharpen your cultivating on your cultivating sweets? Um, you didn't ever think of a problem. Um, if you want to bury it, on the other hand, you need to be putting a lot of soil somewhere so that it just gets bent over and covered up. If you think about it, and you're throwing soil against that plant, what's going to work better to, dump, to knock that plant over? Having the, having the sweeps or the cultivating discs opposite each other, or having them offset? Offset. Offset. Sure, because then the, the soil flow is in one direction, this top is going to be knocked over and buried. Uh, if you're trying to dig up the plant and get uh, and get it loose from the from the, the soil, you probably want some kind of a, uh, something like a duck foot shovel that's a traveling at a fairly steep angle and digging up under there and throwing it up. Okay, so. What kind of tools you use are going to affect how, which of those three actions happen and how you set the tooling up is going to affect which of the three actions you get on the weed. So. Uh, uh, one question about that. You said it's always going to die, is it? Uh, that plant, you cut it. Are you assuming it's in the cotyledon state? Because once that plant is an adult, you can cut it, then you can still going to regrow. Yeah, that's true. That's true. If it's very large, then yes. But if it's, if it's even beyond the cotyledon stage, you know, it's going to depend on the weed when it develops adventitious buds and all of that. But, um, you know, certainly most of our common weeds can get the four, six, two leaves. And still, if you cut it between the cotyledon and the ground and the, the roots, um, you're going to kill it.